All right, great. And if any questions before we get started? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm ready to go. All right. Um, Rob Henderson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Yasha. Great to be here. Um, so I've been following your work for a good long while, um, but reading your memoir, which is out in about a month called Troubled, a memoir of foster care family and social class over uh, the last weeks, um, has put in place a lot of uh, sort of your worldview and your concerns for me. It sort of helped me understand uh, where you're coming from and how you see the world. Um, I look forward to getting into some of the more uh, psychological and sociological aspects of the work later in the conversation. Uh, but, but to start off with, you know, this in its core is a memoir and it's a very moving memoir um, uh, and it's a memoir of your childhood. So what what is uh, the story of your childhood starting with your birth parents? Uh, yeah, so I was born uh, into poverty in Los Angeles and never met my father. Uh, my birth mother didn't know my father either. I mean, she she had no recollection of him when she was asked who, who my father could possibly be. Um, so all of this information I gathered later uh, from social workers who were responsible for my case. But my mother and I, uh, we lived in some cars. We were homeless for a time. Eventually, um, we settled in this slum apartment uh, in L.A. And my mother was addicted to drugs. She was very neglectful, unable to properly care for me. Uh, she would tie me to uh, a chair in another room while she would, or, or I think it was in the, in the dining room, she would get high in her bedroom. She would have random men over at all times of the day and night. Um, while I was struggling in this chair tied uh, with a bathrobe, eventually some neighbors heard me screaming repeatedly and they called the police who then came and, uh, you know, took me away to, to foster care. So my first memories, which I, I opened chapter one with was, um, you know, sort of clinging to my mother as the, as the police were attempting to separate us and, and put her in handcuffs. Um, so I was put into the system at three years old. And, and that's one of the uh, sort of interesting things that you say uh, later in the book, reflecting on that experience that, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, listeners may think uh, in an obvious way it was a good thing that the state intervened and took you out of that home. Uh, clearly your mother was not fit to care for you. Mm -hmm. um, but you observe that no matter how neglected or abused young children are uh, by by the parents, they usually want more than anything else to stay with them. And some of the evidence seems to suggest that that desire is not an irrational one, that uh, actually the results from foster care in particular may end up being worse even than the results of being uh, raised by, by, by neglectful or, or, or abusive parents. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, it's um, there. Yeah, there's there's consistent evidence that children you know, are, are sort of programmed to be loyal to their caretakers, to their parents, to the people who raise them from infancy, uh, even if the child rearing circumstances were less than optimal as they were in my case. I mean, you know, and towards the end of the book, as I'm reflecting on all of this, I, I do say that it was, you know, in the end, it was a good decision to put me in foster care. I mean, these were two horrible um you know, two, two horrible outcomes. I could have either stayed with my mother and lived in that kind of environment or the foster care system, which is also uh, far from optimal as well. So it was just two horrible uh, choices. And sometimes you just have to make one of them. But I do cite research later in the book uh, from, uh, it was a paper led by Amir Saryazlan at Oxford, uh, which was published in 2021. And he and his co-authors essentially sort of analyzed data from essentially siblings within the same uh, birth family, some of the siblings were placed in foster care, or out of home care, and some of the siblings remained with their uh, birth parents. Usually, it was, I mean, and oftentimes it was a single mother, birth mother. Um, and they tracked the outcomes of these kids later and found that the kids, the siblings who were placed in foster care were you know, two to three times more likely to be uh, poor as adults, low income, uh, addicted to substances, homeless, uh, criminally inclined. 
So a lot of sort of less, you know, less than desirable outcomes for, for the kids placed in care relative to their siblings, which does suggest that uh, foster care does have some kind of effect on kids, that sort of severe instability and uncertainty in a young child's life, which is something that I focus on a lot in the book is that, you know, I, I did grow up sort of poor, maybe working class, lower middle class, that kind of, you know, that, that, that strat of society. Um, but it wasn't as if I was... Um, you know, I mean, well, like I said, when, when I was really little, uh, which uh, I, I don't have, you know, I have some flashbulb memories of being living in a car and some some of these kind of memories, too. But but generally speaking, by the time I reached um, the foster system, by the, the time I was three, you know, I was never really uh, hungry or, or without shelter or something like that. But it's the it's the instability, the uncertainty, the sort of squalor of those environments. And then later after I was adopted, you know, it was still it was still kind of like that for me. And that was more, I think, damaging than sort of material impoverishment in and of itself. So, so at three years old, you are taken away from your mother and you're placed in a foster family. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I'm reading this book, and it really is a book that has both um, serious intellectual insights, but 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 that's also uh, just just a compelling read and a, and 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 a moving read um, that feels like a moment of hope. Um, but then. Uh, you know, it turns out that uh, that environment is deeply unstable in a way that's 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 shocking to uh, that was shocking to me. Um, in part because uh, uh, what I think is a very common experience, uh, you then are sort of funneled through a whole different set of foster homes over the course of the following years. So, what was it like to arrive in the foster system, and why is it that? Uh, children so often are then placed in a succession of different foster homes. Yeah, well, I mean, my experience, it was extremely uh, upsetting. Um, you know, I, I just remember, uh, you know, it's a series of adults that I was unfamiliar with that, you know, a, a social worker comes and, you know, they, they're nice enough adults. But uh, when you're a small child and you've lived with your mother for this whole entire, you know, few years, your whole life, essentially up to that point, and then a stranger comes and takes you and live, makes you live with a, another, you know, unfamiliar group of adults and, and children, too. I mean, that was the other thing is, uh, you know, of course, I was moving foster homes every six months to a year or so. But then day to day, I wouldn't know whether I would be moved to a different home. And I also didn't know whether, you know, some of the foster siblings that I'd grown attached to that, you know, we were all kind of in this strange circumstance together, but then, you know, a day would go by or a week would go by and suddenly a foster sibling that I you know, had had formed a bond with would be taken to another home or maybe be placed back with their parents. Um, new kids would come and go all the time. So it was just a total, you know, from, from a small child's point of view, total chaos. Um, and and so the, so why is it like that? I mean, in my case, it was it was unusual because I remember my foster siblings. Often, what would happen is, you know, they're they're you know, many of them didn't know who their fathers were, but their mothers would become addicted to drugs or would have um, maybe some some mental health challenges, and so then the the child would be placed into care, and then the mother would uh, sort of recover from from their condition, and then um, the child would be placed back with her. Uh, but in my case, I didn't have that. So after my mother uh, was arrested, um, she was deported back to uh, South Korea and I was placed into foster care. Um, and so there was no chance of me being reunited with her. And so I was just moving homes every few months. The reason why they, they tend to do this in most cases, uh, my understanding is that they don't want the child to become too attached to any particular foster family in case one of the birth parents becomes uh, able to care for the child or, or a family member of, of the child becomes or, or offers uh, offers to to care for the child. And so this can create sort of difficulties around loyalty, around attachment. And so the child just gets continually moved uh, to prevent that from happening. I also think there's probably just um, a lot of sort of bureaucracy, a lot of messiness within the foster care institution that these things aren't tracked very closely. So in my case, there was no hope of me ever being reunited with any family member, but I was just shuffled around every few months because the system is so overburdened. I think that probably was a, a factor as well. So in a way, the, the logic right or wrong is that you don't want kids to be in one environment for too long because then it creates problems if they are reunited with, with mm. a biological relative. Yes. But that logic was applied to your case, even though in your case it was very clear that this was never going to to happen. Um, yeah. Uh, so, 
what do you think was the impact of moving between these different foster homes in such a regular way? Um, how did that, uh, uh, you know, shape your uh, way of connecting with, with, with other people early in childhood and, and perhaps later on? I mean, I found it very difficult to connect with adults, um, especially after maybe the second or third move. I remember, you know, sort of emotionally, the the difference, different responses that I had. So the first time I was moved into the first home, of course, taken from my mother, the first home, that was very upsetting. The second time I was relocated, that was also extremely difficult for me. But by the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, uh, you know, my emotional response was very blunted and I sort of became numb to it. Probably, you know, this was not a conscious you know, thought that occurred, but it was probably just some sort of instinctive, impulsive, adaptive response that, you know, if you were to feel those intense emotions every six months for, on, you know, it would be very difficult on a small child. And so I kind of just shut down and be, and became numb, used to it, um, became extremely suspicious of the motives of adults of, you know, I just never formed a strong attachment with any of them. And I knew that it wasn't going to last long anyway. Um, and so, you know, I became kind of a cynical little kid or suspicious. Um, you know, I, I thought of all adults as being in this kind of same category, you know, teachers, uh, doctors, uh, social workers. I mean, I did like my social worker. I mean, I could tell that she she did care for me. She would check in on me and sort of visit me. And, you know, but but even then, I it was what, the amount of attachment striking, I had was limited. Well, one mm -hmm. of the striking things reading sort of about your early childhood is that in a way the social worker was the most constant presence in your life because even though presumably you spent more time with some of these foster parents, she was the only person who would sort of show up yeah. regularly. And and, yes. and it was this mixed uh, experience because because it was this person you had some kind of regular relationship with, but of course you would usually show up when you would in fact be taken out of yet another foster home and placed into into a new one. Yeah, it was uh, it was a sort of ambivalent feeling. I mean, I liked her, but uh, every time she arrived, I knew it was for a specific reason. And so, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the, the, the feelings were complex, right? Because, you know, again, I became sort of numb. I, I, I learned to stop becoming too invested in any particular family. But I still, uh, you know, the, the relationship with with Jared, my social worker, you know, we the, 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 the ties remained. Uh, they, they sort of endured across the homes. Um, but yeah, it was, it was difficult. You know, I, I was a poor student in school. I was changing schools all the time. It was, um, you know, I lived in seven different homes over the course of about five years, uh, and we changed schools even more frequently than that. So my grades were, uh, you know, unimpressive and I was just an unfocused little kid. Um, the last foster home you stayed in, um, made a particular impression on me. It was in some ways uh, a more desirable, a more affluent home. Um, your first impression was that uh, sort of it gave you access to certain quote unquote luxuries that you may not have had in some of the other foster homes. But then um, it, it turned out that uh, there's a sort of particular reason why uh, those particular foster parents wanted to have uh, uh, foster children, um, in particular of, 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 of a young age. Um, Tell us about that experience. Yeah, so up until that point, the final foster home, the seventh home that I had lived in, it was so yeah, it was strange at first because every other home until that point had had multiple children. I mean, some of them had upwards of eight or ten kids living in them. Um, and this one, there were none. I was the only foster child, and you know, I remember the the house was very clean. I think the the mother, you know, they, they had two adult children. The father worked. The mother's, you know, I think she was like a stay at home homemaker or something. And she kept it very clean. But then I, I learned that, you know, part of the reason why it was so clean was because they would usually adopt one young boy uh, and, you know, essentially assign a lot of duties, a lot of chores. So I was sweeping and mopping every day. You know, they had two dogs. The My foster mother got a, a parrot. She was kind of an eccentric woman. And she bought this parrot that she kept uh, in the living room. And so I had to feed this, this bird every day. Um, they had a small pool in the backyard that I would, um, you know, monitor and sort of maintain and... A lot of raking leaves so it was a, a very busy period and you know i remember at one point i asked her why do i have to do so many chores and she said something along the lines of um you know it's good for you keeps you out of trouble uh you know there's there are a lot of troublemakers in this neighborhood a lot of bad kids and it's better for you to be here than out there you know causing uh you know getting getting into mischief 
And she wasn't wrong. I mean, there were some, uh, you know, mischievous kids in the neighborhood that I, I did befriend and sort of get into trouble with and learn how to pickpocket from them and steal and all kinds of things. Uh, and so I think it was sort of intertwined. There was self-serving reasoning on on my foster mother's part. But there was also, you know, I think in her mind, she was doing the right thing, even though she could be quite cruel and quite uh, cold toward me. But in, I think in her mind, you know, she convinced herself it was the right way to go. Yeah, I was reflecting on that because um, we'll, we'll get to that later. But 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 uh, you end up joining the, the the military, the air force, and you write positively about the discipline of that environment and uh, contrast it with a lack of discipline and the lack of expectations, lack of rules that shaped a lot of your childhood and youth in ways that you think are detrimental. But I suppose um, uh, it depends on whether those rules and that discipline actually serve some kind of greater good and whether they are also combined with respect for you. And and what seems striking about this home is that, you are, you know, whatever justification this foster mom was telling herself, um, you know, it, it wasn't that she said, well, we, we got to, you know, our educational philosophy is that it's important to have structure for kids. It's that she wanted somebody to help for free to keep the home in whatever clean way she preferred. Yeah, yeah, I never really felt, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting word that you use there, respect. I never really, I mean, I was a small kid. I mean, how much respect can you give to a seven or eight year old kid? But it just, it didn't, I didn't feel like she had my best interest in mind. It, and, and again, like, you know, it was a series of foster homes. I never really felt, um, you know, that any of them really had, you know, they, they sort of kept me alive. And that was kind of their, their job. But beyond that, I never really felt uh, too invested in any of those relationships. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, it was very a lonely experience. I remember that even in the foster homes, you know, it was it was chaotic, all these kids. And, you know, sometimes you had to fight for attention, for toys, for food, for clothes. Um, but in this home, it, I didn't really have that, but it was just a very cold experience. You know, there was no affection, just very much just sort of I'd come home from school and, and start doing the chores and then go to bed, then go to school. And it was just this sort of cycle. Um, where there was not much sort of human contact uh, within the home. And that was, I remember that being very sort of isolating. And at one point, I had this this thought surface in my mind while I was living in this home that I actually felt the feeling of loneliness for the first time um, in, a, in a sort of conscious way, not in just the sort of emotional, you know, why, why do I feel this way? But just like an actual, oh, this is what loneliness is. And, um, and I remember that just uh, sort of washing over me and feeling, um, yeah, sort of truly alone, and yeah, it was just a devastating feeling. Um, so then you're uh, uh, adopted, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that feels like a salvation. It, it turns out to be a somewhat more complicated story. Um, tell us about uh, how, how you learn about your adoption and uh, uh, sort of what that means for your for your childhood and youth. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was a at first it was a great um, you know uh, feeling the 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 news that I was about to be adopted um, and you know it was sort of carefully explained to me by my foster mother and then later by my social worker Jerry that you know this is like you know it's not like you're just going to go to another home and then go eh, this is like a permanent placement you know this is the kind of terminology they would use placement and so um, I realized. Really, what it meant when the Henderson family came to visit me in LA. So they lived in a small kind of blue collar town in Northern California called Red Bluff. They came down to visit me in LA, and you know, I, at one point, I, I think I said Mrs. Henderson. You know, I'd always use that 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 um, those titles for my foster parents, and she said, "You can call me Mom." And you know, that my Mr. Henderson, no, no, you know, I'm your dad. You know, this I'm your mom. And, you know, you can call us that. I think they, you know, they were nice about it. They said, "You can call us what you want, but we'd like you to call us Mom and Dad." And so I did. And that was when I realized like, oh, this is like, oh, I have a mom and a dad now. This is a real family. Um, so we settled back in Red Bluff and yeah, for, you know, a period of about a year or so, it was, uh, you know, a very sort of bright spot in my childhood. Um, you know, my, my mom was an assistant social worker, but she would manage to sort of get a flexible schedule. She'd be home for my sister and I a lot. Um, my adoptive sister who was their uh, biological daughter. Um, and my, uh, adoptive father was a truck driver and, you know, I, there were, uh, there was an occasion where I got to go with him in the truck and sort of explore, you know, we drove to Montana and back and I really enjoyed that experience. And just like having, uh, you know, being willing to risk 
the investment and the the love and the feeling of you know wow this is my family now it was a uh, you know a really uh, delightful experience as a kid uh, but you know after about a year um, my adoptive parents divorced which was really hard um, you know, I was I remember feeling uncertain what that would mean whether I would have to go back into the system or whether you know I'd, I'd, I'd live with one of them or the other or how it would work out and my, my adoptive mother ended up getting custody of me my adoptive father he was very uh, upset at my mother for leaving him and one way that he was able to retaliate was essentially to sever ties with me and you know stop communicating with me so there was a period early on after the divorce or after the separation where my sister and I would sort of go back and forth every week I'd stay with him then the other week we'd stay with my mom and back and forth but then one week my uh you know it was a Sunday evening and my my mom had to explain that it was just going to be my sister this time and that I wasn't going and you know it was I was infuriated I was sad it was just a, a mix of painful emotions um but then yeah she explained that he he was angry with her and this is just you know his his selfish way of of getting back at her and so after you know I'd, I'd never known my birth father I never really had a father figure in any of the foster homes either most of the time we were cared for by um you know by foster mothers by women um and you know then I had uh this this father figure this this man that I called dad and suddenly you know it was like literally no more speaking to him I, I asked if I could at least talk to him on the phone to say goodbye and he had no interest in that and um yeah I was just devastated I was, I was nine years old by this point so yeah, it was really hard. So from that point, I lived with my adoptive mother. Um, we moved into a duplex. Um, and yeah, I was sort of raised by a single mom. I was kind of a latchkey kid at this point. My mom would go into work. By this time, she was you know taking on full full work schedule. Uh, the divorce was kind of financially difficult. So she was working full time. I'd walk to school and back and got a little key and I'd come home. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of supervision uh, by this point. So I started hanging out with, you know, some mischievous kids. And I was kind of a mischievous kid myself, just based on the experiences that I had in foster care. And um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was just, there was a period actually that year that I was with them, my, my grades had improved, and I was doing pretty well in school. And then from there, it, uh, you know, uh, my my academic focus started to diminish. So tell us a little bit about uh, your sort of academic trajectory um, at that stage. I mean, you're clearly an, an exceptionally smart person but you did very badly in school uh throughout uh your your childhood or throughout most periods of your childhood and um you struggled to 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 learn to read um uh, you know why is it that even uh you know unusually smart kids struggle so much academically when they are growing up in these kind of unstable environments and and how is it that you came uh, quite late to 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 learn to read proficiently, um, and what 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 impact did that have on your life? Yeah, well, so the the delay in my reading skills and literacy. I mean, it was you know, it was just part of it was moving schools all the time. Part of it was my you know my I had mentioned this kind of suspicion or this derisive attitude towards adults. You know, if teachers would ask me to do something or read something or whatever, I would just ignore it or, or you know, put in a half-hearted effort just to avoid, you know, being being uh, uh, penalized in some way. And so um, eventually, you know, once I once I learned how to, you know, I, I had to teach myself to read, essentially. I mean, no, nobody in the foster homes was really monitoring this. Uh, no one was reading to me or my foster siblings. The parents tended to be very busy and it was just too much. I mean, I can almost understand it from their perspective, too, that if a kid's living with you for just a few months, you start reading to them, you start building an attachment to them, and then suddenly they're gone. That's going to be emotionally hurtful to you, too. Uh, and so I think a lot of the adults were very guarded as far as how close they became to any of the children. Um, and so, yeah, I taught myself to read. I, I, at one point, I decided I wanted to be a scientist because I watched Bill Nye the Science Guy on TV. And I was like, oh, that looks like a cool job. I told this to my teacher. And she's like, you're going to have to learn to read if you want to be a scientist. And I'm like, no, I don't. Bill, Bill Nye doesn't read. So I don't need to. And she's like, oh, yeah, he does. You just never see him read. And then I'm like, oh, you know, it, it sort of clicked for me that, oh, OK. So I taught myself to read. And uh, but but I mean, the, the, the question you had about how does this, you know, how do these environments sort of suppress a kid's potential or interfere with their growth. I mean, 
you know, I think a lot of people are sort of misguided in terms of how they understand, you know, what sort of cultivates uh, those those potentials in a kid. I mean, you could be curious, you can be smart, you can be, you know, you can have good teachers, but if your home life is total chaos with no supervision, no adults sort of checking in on you, are you doing your homework? You know, let's sit down and you have any questions or, you know, sort of getting them the attention and the care that they need. Um, they're just going to flounder. So all of the, you know, all of the pieces for me were there. I just didn't have anyone to sort of shepherd me along and, and, you know, changing schools all the time wasn't helpful either. I mean, there is research indicating that if you have a kid who's poor, who's living in a sort of deprived, unstable environment, if they can build one solid relationship with an adult, even if, you know, it doesn't have to be their parent, it can be a teacher or a coach or someone like that, but just one adult who's sort of looking out for them on a regular basis, checking in, making sure that they're, um, you know, doing their studies and, and forming good habits. But I didn't have that. I had adults around me who probably did have my best interest in mind, but it was just changing all the time. Just a lot of sort of shuffling and chaos and, and um, instability. And so uh, that was not good for my academic focus. And I think a lot of it was kind of, you know, I, I was very angry as a kid and I didn't feel you know, once I did learn to read and once I was adopted, I was putting in a pretty good effort. At one point I got, I think third, I got third place in a, the school spelling bee. And, you know, I, I was putting in the effort because I had good parents, my adoptive parents, I wanted to do well for them. Um, you know, I, I, that was the longest I'd been in a school. I was there for a whole year. Um, but then once that started to deteriorate after the divorce, after the separation and everything else. I just wanted to express that anger in some way. And one way was to just stop caring about school. So, yeah, I mean, this is one and, of the and, things, and right? That's, that's yeah, one of yeah. the things that, that I found striking mm -hmm. uh, reading the book that, that sort of has this very strong correlation in different stages of your life between the stability in the home and how you're doing in life and how you're doing in school. So obviously there's some kind of long-term effects, as, as you argue persuasively, from uh, having an unstable environment in general. But but even within that, when there were sort of more stable and happier moments, uh, uh, you know, quite immediately you seemed to thrive. And when that was disrupted, um, you, uh, uh, you, you know, that had a direct impact on you. Um, you know, one of those periods is when um, your adoptive mother... Uh, Uh, gets together uh, uh, with a new partner, a woman, and uh, she becomes, uh, I suppose, a kind of mom to you. I don't know whether you use that term. Um, uh, and 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 that's sort of a second period in which you're doing better academically and 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 in other ways. And then when that gets disrupted again, um, uh, uh, sort of that has an immediate impact on 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 your life. So perhaps tell us a little bit about um, uh, what your high school years were like and. Um, Uh, you know, what that teaches us perhaps about how it is that many of your friends, um, uh, some of whom were uh, uh, talented in all kinds of ways, um, um, athletically talented or intellectually talented, um, uh, ended up uh, getting on, 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 on the wrong path, um, in part because they faced uh, you know, somewhat similar circumstances to yours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, yeah, as you had mentioned, so my mother fell in love with a woman named Shelley and they raised me through basically my middle school years, my sort of early adolescence. Um, but they, you know, there was a, there was a you know, massive family tragedy where Shelley was shot and this, you know, sort of upended the structure in my life and the family for the home and, You know, there, there were other things going on, too. I mean, Shelley had three teenage daughters. Two of them were teenage moms, and they were kind of moving in and out. And there was sort of drama with their boyfriends. And there was just a lot of sort of domestic, uh, yeah, I guess drama would be one, one way of putting it. But generally, uh, before that, before the, the shooting, before the accident, um, my life was pretty stable. My grades had improved. By high school, um, you know, post you know, Shelly's injury, she, she managed to recover, but it was very slow and very painful. Um, you know, all of the structure that I had had, had, uh, you know, fell by the wayside and yeah, my grades had deteriorated. I was, you know, I, I had a bunch of friends in high school who, you know, their, their lives, their, their home lives probably weren't, you know, they weren't quite as, 
Mm, you know, sort of outlet, you know, as much of outliers as mine, but they, you know, so I had five close friends, two were raised by single moms, one was raised by a single dad, one was raised by his grandmother because his mom was addicted to drugs and his dad was in prison. And I had one, one friend who, uh, you know, he was raised by his parents, but they were very neglectful and he was kind of on the periphery of our friend group anyway, but, you know, you had mentioned sort of athletically talented. So this, this guy, he, um, I read about him in the book that he, was doing okay in school, not great, but he did fail one of his classes. Uh, and he, you know, his coach was, was uh, had, had told him, had explained that he could get a football scholarship to play for, I want to say it was Sacramento State, one of the state colleges in California. All he had to do was take a makeup class. Uh, he had failed this class. He takes this two week sort of, you know, remediation class. You know, if he can manage to get a B in it, uh, that this would uh, bump his GPA up, he would be eligible for the scholarship. And instead, he, you know, I think he went for two or three days, then come out and, you know, he would then he hung out with with my friends and I and just totally ditched everything. His parents were, you know, they they were half checked out. They didn't really care. And he ended up failing the remedial class and never got his football scholarship. And now he's uh, working at a gas station. He has two children with two different women. Um, and my understanding is he has no contact with with any of them, really. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I wrote about that to kind of illustrate this point that he could have had a very different life uh, if he had just had parents to, to sort of pressure him more, you know, adults looking out for him more, forcing him to sit in that desk every morning and do the work, do your homework, even if it goes against his, you know, kind of impulsive 16 or 17 year old inclinations and he, and he would rather go and, you know, come, come hang out at the beach or by the river with me and my friends. Um, but he didn't have that. And so he he ended up squandering his his future. And I remember my friends and I had always thought he was sort of college. He was the one, you know, he, he, he could have gone to college. He was a, a talented athlete and he, you know, he had a, a, among our friend group, probably the best parents, which kind of a low bar, but he had that, he had the chance. Whereas the rest of my friends, you know, none of them went to college. Um, you know, some of them dropped out of community college and ended up working sort of menial minimum wage kind of jobs. And that was kind of the direction I was at by my senior year of high school. Uh, my mother and Shelly had separated. I moved in with my friend and his brother and his father. And I had to get a part time job to help pay for rent and help pay for expenses. Um, and that was kind of the path that I was on uh, when I was 17. And then yeah, I just kind of made this impulsive decision to to enlist. And that was what got me out of that environment and onto a sort of a better path. Um, yeah, sort of my impression from 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 reading your account is that um, you got like in two ways. One is to um, uh, pick up an interest in martial arts and um, uh, sort of have, a, you know, some people within that martial arts gym who both expected a little bit of discipline from you and gave you something to work towards. And then um, it was taking a standardized test in the senior year of college, standardized test that you didn't prepare for with uh, SAT tutors um, <laughs> uh, and uh, online prep courses, but with, uh, I believe, getting drunk uh, the night before the test. Um, but, 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 but sort of tell us about what that first kind of break in, 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 in your life story uh, was. Right. So, so I, I mean, I, I barely graduated high school. I had a 2.2 GPA, which I think comes out to something like a C minus average, um, bottom third of my class, uh, you know, by, by my senior year, you know, I, I had mentioned, so my, my mother and Shelly had split, I moved in with my friend and his dad. And, you know, by that point, there was basically no supervision at all. And, you know, I would do these kinds of calculations of, oh, you know, if you miss 12 classes, you know, you're, you get deducted this much percentage of your grade. And I would try to figure out, okay, how do I how can I ditch enough classes to barely pass the class? And that's what I did. And um, so, uh, yeah, I took this, I took this military standardized test, um, not really knowing what to expect. I mean, I, it was just impulsive and short-sighted. And like you said, the night before I, I got drunk and played video, I played Xbox with my friends and, you know, I knew I didn't have to take the test till 1030 the next day. So I figured, oh, you know, I, I can stay up late and sleep through and, I had an excuse to miss school and showed up hungover, maybe even a little bit still drunk by this point, and um, took this test, uh, met with the Air Force recruiter, and he was explaining to me that this is actually a really good score. 
and that I qualified for just about every job that was available. And when I, so, and then at one point he explained to me that these, these scores, so, so this, the test that I took is called the armed services vocational aptitude battery, you know, in, in the military, just it's called the ASVAB, uh, the acronym, and you can convert this because it, it tests a lot of the same skills as the SAT sort of, you know, math, arithmetic, literacy, you know, basic problem solving. Um, so the, my recruiter showed me that these scores could be converted into SAT scores. And when he did this, and I noticed that my score was the same as one of my classmates who was about to go off to college. And, you know, he was a straight A student. And I realized, oh, I could have gotten the same SAT score as my, you know, the one smart guy that I would sometimes hang out with and who was doing well in class and was going to college. And, you know, by this point, it was too late. Um, I was, you know, a couple of months out from graduating and there was no hope for me to go to college by this point. Um, but it did sort of put this idea in mind. It planted the idea in my mind that, oh, maybe someday I can go back. Um, again, like sort of that potential was there. I just need to figure out, you know, what I need to do to convince colleges later on that, uh, you know, these, these grades aren't actually indicative of, of what I'm capable of. And it was the test score that did that for me. And so this is why I'm, you know, I sometimes publicly talk about how, you know, standardized tests, of course, they shouldn't be the only thing you look at, but they should be an important piece of the puzzle when you're evaluating candidates, because there are a lot of poor kids who don't do well in terms of their grades for a variety of reasons, whether they're living in chaos, whether they have parents who are checked out, whether they, I mean, a lot of teenagers, they're actually, you know, they are focused and they are disciplined, but they have to work part-time jobs to help support their families. And so they don't have a lot of time to do their homework or study. Uh, but if you give them uh, an afternoon to take a test and you realize, oh, this is actually a, a pretty bright uh, uh, academically uh, oriented kid. So, so that was it, you know, the, the ASVAB was uh, sort of one uh, illuminating moment for me was that test score and the promise that it held for for my future later. And so you decide to join the Air Force in in good part off of uh, the sort of options that this standardized test gives you. Yeah. And for the first time, uh, certainly since you're a little kid, you're in a very structured environment with very strong uh, requirements uh, of you. Um, How did that transform uh, your attitude towards uh, life? And, and, and in what ways did you find that structured environment to, in fact, be helpful? Yeah, I mean, it was, at, I mean, I, I, in hindsight, you know, I, I, I sort of seeing the praises of this structure, but I remember in the moment I, I detested it, you know, because I, I went from this environment of almost complete freedom as a 17-year-old kid um, you know, I, but my friend's father was working, he was on the road, he was a private investigator, he was never home. And so essentially, it was this house of teenage boys, we had friends over all the time, no supervision whatsoever. Um, and then suddenly, I was in an environment of extreme uh, rigidity and structure, where every aspect of our lives, you know, new recruits, the lives are just sort of tightly controlled. Everything from the way that you wear your uniform to the way that you make your bed to the way, you know, how, how you know, your room has to be spotless, living quarters, everything is just tightly monitored. Um, punctuality, all of these things that uh, these sort of soft skills um, that a lot of kids who are you know, born into impoverished environments don't really pick up. They don't really learn. And so that was extremely helpful for me. Um, Despite in the moment not liking it, uh, I, under I understood later. Within a couple of years, I started to get it. You know, once I started seeing the trajectories of my, the lives of my friends. So by the time I was 19 or 20 years old, after I, I enlisted when I was 17, I had to get like special permission, had to have my adoptive mother sign a form. Uh, so I joined right out of high school um, when I was 17. But then, by the, yeah, by the time I was 20 and I saw where my friends' lives were headed, um, and I realized like, oh, I definitely made the right decision. You know, even if, the, you know, ultimately I left the military, it was, you know, I, I needed to, to get out of there. But when I was that young, I needed that kind of structure. I was enlisted for eight years and I needed all eight of those years in order to instill the sort of discipline and the habits and the sort of expectations for myself uh, in order to sort of become an adult. Uh, because at 17, I was just completely unfocused. Um, you know, if you had put me in a college campus, Uh, when I was 17, I mean, I, did, I would have failed out immediately. Um, and again, not not because uh, I was was what uh, unequipped or didn't have the potential to do well, but just because the habits that I had formed were just not not there. Um, no, no habits. So the military was really helpful in that regard. The other thing is, you know, I point this out in the book, too, was just time. 
um, I learned a lot in the military and sort of instilled this sort of discipline and everything else that I had mentioned, but also just, you know, I, 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 I cite uh, this uh, concept in psychology called the young male syndrome, uh, which is essentially, I mean, the, 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 the punchline of the finding is that, you know, consistently across societies, regardless of time and place, the segment of society that, you know, is the most sort of criminally inclined, most impulsive, most violent, most aggressive tend to be young males in their teens and early 20s um, for a variety of reasons, uh, hormonal, biological, and to some extent sort of social and cultural as well. Um, and so, but once those years pass, you see this sort of massive drop off in uh, uh, criminal inclination and, and aggressive impulses and so on. And so because I was locked in the military during that time, and you know, we still sort of acted it out. I mean, I got into fights and stuff, but it was still a, sort of in a controlled environment um, that I was able to sort of mature and, you know, whatever, allow my frontal lobes to develop and become a, just a, a more sort of self-aware and mature person from age 17 to, to age 25 during that period when if I had not been in that structured environment, um, my life could have gone uh, very differently. And, you know, like I said, so I had I had two friends who ended up in prison and one friend who was shot to death. And it was a very realistic possibility that I could have ended up in one of those paths um, as well. But I, if not for being sort of locked away in this in this kind of military environment. And so you do very well in the military. You're promoted very quickly. And it feels like um, we're, 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 we're building towards the natural arc of a memoir, which is triumph out of adversity. Um, but, but, but there's a big uh, stumbling block in, in between, mm -hmm. which is that you hadn't really... Um, processed your experiences as a child, you weren't really in touch with your own emotions, and you dealt with that in the way that many people do, which is through uh, the overconsumption of alcohol. And so there's a, a genuine moment of, 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 of crisis while you're uh, enlisted. Um, uh, what do you think propelled you towards that period of, of, of alcoholism? And, and what did it do for you when you got intensive therapy and were able to uh, process some of those childhood traumas, how did that transform you? Yeah, yeah, this is that. So that part of the book was was difficult to write. I'd, I'd never spoken publicly about this before. Um, and part of it was, you know, all, all you know, the things that you, you would expect. I mean, I think some of your self-consciousness, shame, trying to, you know, be as honest as I could. And I wanted it. I wanted to do it right, and I think the the book format gave me as much time and space as I needed. I couldn't have fit that into you know a simple essay for my Substack or something. It needed to be in that format, um, in the context of the entire book, right? So, I think the so so my mother I had mentioned was addicted to drugs. There was probably some biological predisposition there, and then you know I, when I was writing the book and sort of reflecting on these memories and everything that I had gone through, and I mean the you know, the tendencies were already already there. I mean, as a little kid, I mean, I started drinking when I, I mean, I had my first sip of beer when I was four or five years old. I write about this in one of the foster homes, started drinking beer, essentially, when I was a toddler. And then, um, you know, by nine, I was drinking tequila and um, my friends and I would like find ways to, like we would experiment and try to take cold medicine to get high. Um, and then by the time I was a teenager, high school, I had a neighbor who would sell weed and pills and, you know, we were always trying to find ways. We played the choking game, which is essentially cutting off oxygen in order to, you know, sort of stimulate yourself and get high. We were always finding these ways to like, you know, this, this sort of thrill seeking behavior, which is not uncommon for, for teenage boys in, in, in these environments. Um, and then in the military, you know, there was a period where I wasn't able to indulge those um, impulses. But then after I turned 21, after I moved off base, once I got a house with some friends and had a little bit more freedom um, away from the, the military base itself, um, you know, essentially like the short story is like once you reach a certain rank, achieve a certain rank in the military, you become like more of an adult. They trust you. You go off base. You get your own house. You get your own place. Uh, and when that had happened for me, uh, I got this house with a bunch of friends, too. So you stick a bunch of you know, 21, 22 year old guys together. You know, the alcoholism, you know, it's. The military does have like a huge alcohol drinking culture. It's it's um you know just just a part of it, and uh, and I would indulge it. And um, at a certain point, I found and myself presumably drinking, even though know, I, I imagine that the pay is moderate at that stage of a career, you know you have mm -hmm. a lot of disposable income, right? You have no responsibilities. You... Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good. Yeah. I hadn't. You know. No. No kids. No wife. No family. So yeah. Just. Just. You know. Early twenties. A bunch of other guys who like to drink. You know. I was making more money than I'd ever had in my life. And, uh, and yeah, so it, 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 you know, we, we when you're with other people doing the same thing, I mean, it was kind of like like that sort of frat house environment of you know, wake up in the morning, go to work, come home, and start drinking immediately, uh, and then drink the entire weekend away. Uh, and then after a few years of that, I realized that I wasn't drinking for fun anymore. I was drinking just to function, just to sort of manage my emotions or my feelings, or to to quell any you know, because th there was a period where I was suffering from pretty debilitating depression and i found that one way to sort of deal with that in a you know in an unproductive way was to just drink and spend time with people and you know i yeah, i was just uh in a really bad place by you know this was 22 23 years old um and at one point you know there was a sort of confluence of circumstances you know bad things that had happened uh in in sequential order one was that one of my work friends committed suicide um we weren't especially close, but we were close enough that I saw him every day and to learn that he had done that, um, especially because he'd always been this sort of happy go lucky, upbeat guy. I remember being kind of down that he was leaving. He was about to separate from the military. Um, I was down that he was leaving. But then when I learned that he had killed himself, that was, um, you know, that was devastating. And then I had, you know, my girlfriend had just dumped me, essentially. Uh, she and I were having difficulties. I mean, Almost every relationship I'd had at that point, there were, you know, it was kind of fraught with difficulties because I was a bad person to be dating um, because of all the experiences I'd had and what I'd learned about relationships, which is essentially that they were all disposable and to not invest myself too much in any of them. And so those two things together, and in addition to, you know, there were some other things going on too, but that, those were the two main things. Um, one night I just started drinking and continued to drink. And then even after I was essentially blackout drunk, I, I drank, you know, another bottle of bourbon, woke up in the bathtub, covered in vomit, um, ended up in the ICU, alcohol poisoning. And I told the, you know, I told the doctor what I'd been doing. And then they got a psychiatrist and I explained, you know, she was asking me a series of questions, how much I'd been drinking and for how long and, you know, gave me sort of a battery of questions about depression and all these other things. And essentially she recommended me for this inpatient treatment program, essentially rehab, the six week program. Um, and so, yeah, that was a period of, you know, sort of reflection and recovery. And it was, uh, you know, I remember being really embarrassed about it because, you know, at work I was actually doing okay. I had friends, I knew that the rumors would start and, by this point, you know, I, I was starting to think about what I would do after the military. I thought about college, but by this point I thought like, you know, if I'm in rehab, you know, college is not really in the cards for me. Um, and so, yeah, it was a six week program and, you know, I built a sort of relationship with one of the counselors there and some of the other patients and yeah, I realized I'd been running from a lot of the things that I had experienced. I mean, I, I never, like I, I saw them visit at home you know, I, I had a pretty close relationship with my adoptive sister, but I wouldn't go home for the holidays. I didn't really talk to my adoptive mom that much. Um, I had completely lost touch with Shelly. Um, you know, I would I would visit home. I would visit my high school friends. I'd visit my sister, but that was about it. And, um, you know, I decided that it was you know time to fix that and try to try to be a better son, try to, you know, re uh, and address all of the things that I've been through. And one of the transformations you you talk about is 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 sort of learning, well, unlearning the behavior of distance from others and and yourself. Um, uh, you know, learning what it's like to be in tune with your emotions and what it's like to to to, to trust having uh, lasting relationships with others. Um, you know what? What does that look like to, to 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 realize about yourself that this is how you've been shaped by your childhood, and to sort of set out to uh, unlearn those behaviors? That sounded to me like an incredibly challenging thing to um, uh, to do. I mean, it, it was it was challenging. I mean, I you know to to realize that. Um... I mean, even the feeling of love, you know, I, I never really understood what it was, um, you know, by, by this point, you know, my, so one of the counselors, uh, when I was in treatment had, you know, he, he knew that I, I liked to read, so he would hand me these books and, you know, about sort of attachment theory and, 
you know, sort of the early parent child bonds and all these kinds of things. And I'd read about them. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the sort of the consistent picture that emerged when I was reading this was the first five to seven years of, of a child's life are critical for sort of uh, developing the capacity to to emotionally attach to someone and to build relationships. You know, some of you know, some of these early theorists, these attachment theorists suggested that the, the, the relationship you form with your mother or with your first caregiver is a template for all of your future relationships, that kind of thing. But for me, you know, the first seven years of my life was, you know, total chaos. Um, and I found it difficult to truly trust anyone. And, you know, I had friends, but it was like very, you know, sort of shallow, superficial teenage male friendships. Uh, you know, drinking together and and insulting one another and that kind of thing. Um, and once I real you know, sort of understood the reasoning behind my behaviors and why it was so difficult for me, and you know, I and I talked to my sister about this too. I mean, that was one relationship I think I did have. You know, the ability to to form a, a close relationship, and I talked to her about some of the stuff and realized, yeah, this is um, I'm never going to be able to go back in time and you know, fix any of this. But from from this point forward, I can at least attempt to, even if I don't necessarily always feel attached to people, um, I can at least behave that way and try to, you know, just, just be a better family member, be a better friend, those kinds of things. And I found that just through the process of that, I do feel better. I do feel better doing that. I, uh, and at that point, I mean, I was 23, 20, 20, I was 24 when I went to rehab and realized, you know, having those realizations, it was just at first very difficult for me. And I remember arguing against it and saying, you know, I, I was actually fine. You know, it's just this alcohol thing. You know, once I stop drinking, I'll be OK. But the alcohol was just a symptom of something else. And once I addressed that, um, you know, things things started to turn around for me. But it took, you know, it took it took a couple of months for me to fully accept it. And and to be open with it, with with my mom, I, I called Shelly for the first time. I mean, she and I spoke for the first time in about seven years or something and told her everything. And I was really um, surprised and I guess gratified. I mean, it's, you know, because I asked her, why haven't you, you know, we, we haven't spoken in seven years. You never called me. And after you and mom split and she told me that, you know, she was running from her emotions, too. She was doing the same thing. Um, you know, sort of learning that this is how, you know, how adults, this is like a very sort of maladaptive strategy a lot of adults use is to just sort of run away from everything and and withdraw and try to forget. And it usually doesn't work. At least in my case, it didn't work. And so, so around, yeah, so around this time, your uh, enlistment is, 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 is coming to an end and you mm -hmm go to, I guess, a college counselor. I don't know exactly what the job title would have been and somebody yeah. in the military and say, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love reading. I'm pretty interested in the world. I, I, I might want to go to college. Um, what uh, was the initial advice from the uh, Air Force and how is it that you didn't end up luckily uh, following it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny. Like, I, I've, I've talked to other military vets about this. Like, other, other, you know, vets who've been successful in their sort of educational ambitions and gone to good schools and everything. But I told, I tell them this story too, so I'll, I'll tell it. So I went to this, this, the education center on base. Most American military bases have an education center, and you know, they sort of help people to enroll in night classes or sort of uh, uh, tell them about the GI Bill, which is a, uh, you know, essentially like this t tuition coverage for, um, for a degree. I went to, I made this appointment. I talked to this education counselor on base and I told them my plan, you know, I'm, I'm, I have about what a year left on my enlistment. I'd like to go to college. What should I do? And, you know, he told me about the GI bill, essentially the GI bill covers tuition. They also cover, um, they, they provide a living, living stipend depending on your zip code. So I told him, you know, my, my mom lives in San Jose. Cause he asked, where's your family from? Where did, where are they based? And I said, Oh, my mom's in San Jose. So he pulls up, you know, a calculator. He's like, Oh, that's near San Francisco. If you move to San Francisco or you commute from San Jose, you'll get, you know, this 3000 plus dollars stipend a month. This was 2014, but yeah, it was $3,000 a month. If you um, just move back in with your parents, take this $3,000 a month over the course of your four year degree program, you'll graduate, you'll have a bachelor's degree and 120 something thousand dollars. And he was essentially telling me, you know, be a boomerang kid, move back in with your parents, you know, enroll in some like, you know, online degree or the best, you know, the, 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 the easiest college that'll take you whatever. And I'm like, this is uh this is like not the advice that I wanted. You know, I want to go to a good school. I want to get the best education I can. 
I also can't move back in. You know, my mother and her new partner by this point, they were living in a rent controlled apartment in San Jose. Like there was no space for me to live there. Um, and so, yeah, in this college counselor's mind, I still had like my childhood bedroom or something. And that was, you know, that was not a, an option for me. So and then I, you yeah. mentioned that you talked to other people uh, who yeah. have a military background. Was that typical of them as well? Or you sort of get un unlucky? No, no, no. Some of them, it was about 50, 50. Some of them say like, yeah, that's like, they kind of like, they don't know what they're doing. You know, a lot of it is like these, these people are idiots. And some of them are like, you know, it's not, it's not terrible advice for, for like, you know, cause a, a lot of that's, you know, they're, they're, they don't have the, they didn't have, you know, just to be frank, they didn't have the same kind of ambitions that I had as far as the kind of colleges that I was looking at or hoped to get into, you know, at the time, I don't know how realistic it was, but it was still something that I wanted was just get into a really good school. Uh, for you know a lot of this, maybe maybe it's not a terrible idea to just you know get a bachelor's degree, save up some money, and and take that route. Um, so it's kind of a mixed you know mixed opinions uh, on on that kind of advice. But for me, it was probably the wrong advice. Uh, so I went online and um, you know sort of searched around. I you know did some Google searches and eventually connected with the Yale Veterans Association because you know, I, I googled some variation of you know veteran interested in school or tips for vet, something like that. And uh, the Yale Veterans Association was one of the first hits. I emailed them, they connected me with someone and eventually they, someone there recommended this program, the Warrior Scholar Project for me, which was this new program that had just been launched uh, to help veterans apply for school, to improve their study habits, their academic skills, that kind of thing. I applied for that, managed to get in. Uh, and it was just like a two week academic boot camp is the way that they uh, marketed themselves. It's a two week academic boot camp. We're going to sort of teach you how to write an essay, how to, you know, communicate with college admissions uh, uh, staff and all this kind of stuff. And it was really helpful for me. Um, and I stayed in touch with with some of the people who were involved. I mean, some some of the people involved were actual vets, but a lot of them were just tutors from elite universities. They had tutors from Vassar and Yale and Dartmouth and, you know, just these like bright young undergrads who or recent graduates who uh, wanted to help, you know, old vets like me get into get into college. And so um, that was really helpful for me, too. And they you know, they proofread my my college admissions essays. And yeah, it was a great program. And so in a way, this was uh, your first exposure to a certain stratum of American society, um, to, you know, people, uh, recent graduates from Ivy League universities, most of whom presumably in the case of these tutors came from uh, very affluent backgrounds, um, uh, uh, you know, and then later you... Um, were able to get into Yale and 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 went there as a mature student, enrolled as an undergraduate. Um, what were your first encounters with that social circle, which is so powerful, so influential in the United States? I guess in the terminology of ethnography, you have a kind of outsider inside of you. You, in many ways, went outsider to that kind of social group, but you lived uh, among it as an insider um, and and have become, in a way, a part of it. So 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 what? Um, sort of where your observations when you arrived for a preparation program and when you arrived finally um, as an undergrad at Yale? Yeah, well, I remember uh, when I was at the, the Warrior Scholar Projects talking to these, you know, these these young elite college grads and they told me to, to watch the West Wing. You know, they were giving me recommendations and tips and I was sort of interested in their... Uh, in, in their interests and their sort of pop cultural preferences and those kinds of things and two two separate uh, uh, tutors had recommended I watch the West Wing. And I, you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, two Ivy League grads are telling me to watch the West Wing. That means all, you know, they all watch the West Wing and I have to watch it too, because I want to know, like, what is it about this show? And what if I do manage to get into college and someone makes a reference to the show? You know, I, I don't want to be left in the dark here. So I watched a couple of seasons and it was just a lot, like the first two seasons, it was just a lot of talk about college too. I remember, um, you know, the staff talking about how they'd gone to Harvard and Yale and these kinds of places. And realizing like, oh, this is, um, it seems to me like college matters a lot and and that there's, you know, there's a sort of a, a ranking, a hierarchy. And I, and, I, and I guess like implicitly or, you know, I, I'd known about it, you know, these these colleges are very famous, but the fact that these two grads had rec recommended the show and then watching it and kind of cemented it for me. Um, then, yeah, I, I finally managed to get in. Uh, I got into Yale. Um, and... Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it was interesting. Like, at first, I remember not being 
uh, I actually was was surprised how normal I guess the students were. Just uh, in terms, you know, I guess I had in my mind like you know at Ivy League University, it's it's like I don't know, just people wearing very fancy clothes and uh, I don't know, just like uh, the kind of I don't know, like an Oxford Don kind of professorial types. But the professors and everybody they just seemed like normal people. Uh, they were dressed like regular college students the way that I would see on like TV or movies about college. Uh, you know, kids wearing flip flops or whatever. Like everyone just seemed normal. Um, and gradually, I would come to learn that actually, you know, the the sort of modern, trendy, you know, it's 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 unfashionable to be very flashy with your money now, or with, uh, you know, if you're a member of the upper upper middle class, if you come from an affluent family, you shouldn't flash it too loudly, uh, and it's better to sort of downplay it and and to blend in that kind of thing. Um, but then, you know, I would learn like, oh, so and so's dad is the president of this, like, you know, TV network or this or that or the other. And I'm like, oh, wow, like, but but no one talks about it. It's very sort of hush hush as far as like how much money people have or how famous people's parents are or whatever. Um, and so that was like sort of one shock was this sort of, OK, they seem normal, but actually they, you know, they they're just as rich as the Happy League kids of the past. They just don't show it as much. The other was. Um, you know, the the preoccupation with with news and media. I mean, it's funny, like now I'm a writer and now I sort of keep up with these things. But at the time, this is 2015, um, you know, I, I had grown up never reading the news. Um, you know, my, my mom and Shelly subscribed to the Red Bluff Daily News, which was the local newspaper. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, they, they would read it, but we, we couldn't afford cable. You know, I didn't watch The Daily Show or any of the, you know, popular cable news channels. It was just not on my radar, you know, the, and this is, this is sort of, um, corroborated by a lot of uh, research on class, on ethnography, and so on, that working class families don't actually talk politics that much at the table. It's just like not as bit, it's not as prominent of a conversation piece compared to sort of middle, upper middle class and above that um, talking about current events is very much a part of, you know, it's, it's like a hallmark of that social strata. Um, so I would go around campus and people would ask me about, you know, this, whatever, this op-ed in the New York Times or this, you know, this, this splashy essay in the Atlantic or this thing that everyone's talking about. And I'm like, I don't even know what these are. Like, I know what the New York Times is, but like, I don't know who this writer who, who wrote this thing is. And gradually, you know, I, I felt like very out of my depth. And so I started to read all of these things and try to keep up with it and realize like, oh, like this is part of the assimilation into this environment is sort of having a cursory knowledge of current events, what people are talking about. And not necessarily the concrete details of these newsworthy events, but what opinion to hold or what the opinions out there are that people are are describing. So, you know, this columnist said this, but this person said that. And, you know, to, to at least like know and and to, to recapitulate these arguments. Um, and so, of course, there's the money piece. There's the sort of cultural piece. And then the other was the, was the family, uh, just how different these students' families were from the ones that I had grown up with. So... You know, I tell this story in the book about how I was in this um, this this seminar of twenty students, and the professor administered an anonymous poll, uh, asking how many of us had been um, raised by both of our birth parents. And uh, she put up the results on you know this PowerPoint slide, and it was anonymized. But essentially, what I found was that out of twenty students, it was just me and one other student in this class, two people who had not been raised by both of our birth parents. And so when I saw that, just like you know, one giant bar and one little, I'm like. What is like what ninety percent or and and uh and I thought back to my that's that's yeah. that's a moment uh uh that I related to I come from uh mm. uh very different background, very different story. Um but uh but my, my parents were never married. Um and I grew up uh with, with my mom who's a single mm. uh, mom. And when I came to graduate school in the United States, because there's also a kind of cultural geographic difference here between Europe and, and the US, I was struck by the fact that nobody I knew at grad school in America um, certainly had parents who were not married. I mean, mm. literally nobody I can think of. Um, mm. And then very few of them had parents who were divorced. And I was really struck uh, mm. by that contrast to uh, my experience growing up in kind of you know, middle, middle class artistic circles in, in Germany, which were which were very different in, in, in that respect even. Um, mm. uh, naturally, when you arrived at Yale, or understandably when you arrived at Yale, you had a kind of imposter syndrome, right? I mean, you graduated High school, as you said, with 2.2 GPA, you didn't have a lot of uh, friends or acquaintances who were at those kinds of schools. And you thought, my God, you know, these kids are all going to be smarter and more well-read and more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, but then you described that uh, quite quickly you lost that imposter uh, syndrome. Um, why is it that you lost it so quickly? Or how is it that you realized that perhaps your classmates 
uh, were not quite as uh, smart or impressive uh, uh, as you might have expected. Yeah, well, so I arrived on campus at a very, you know, kind of unique time. Uh, arguably, I arrived sort of to witness the birth of what is now called wokeness. I mean, I know there's sort of, you know, there's like an intellectual genealogy of where it all comes from and critical theory and all of that. But I at least saw the birth of the sort of the modern version of it. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, I, I left the Air Force in August, started uh, my first semester at Yale in September. And then in October, <laughs> there was this... Of 2015. Uh, of 2015. Massive controversy. I'm sure a lot of your listeners would be familiar with the, you know, what's now referred to as the Halloween costume controversy at Yale with the Christakises. So Erica and Nicholas Christakis, who were two professors uh, and, you know, basically, you know, the, the Yale administration in the lead up to Halloween of 2015, the Yale administration released this email essentially, you know, asking students to be, you know, sensitive and, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, saying, you know, don't, don't, don't be offensive in your, in your Halloween costume, something like that. Erica Christakis, who was the associate master of one of the colleges, and she was on the faculty. Um, now they call them heads of colleges, but at that point they were still using this term master and associate master. She wrote an, a response email just to the students within her residential college, essentially saying like, you know, you're all adults. Do we really need the administration interfering with Halloween costumes of all things and essentially defending freedom of expression? And... The uproar was just incredible. Shocking, shocking uh, stuff. It was, I I mean, I was just totally mystified <laughs> by the response to it. I mean, I think a lot of people were mystified, but I was very mystified simply because I read the email four or five times in a row and I still couldn't get what was offensive about it. I didn't really get, you know, I was just, I, I was so removed from the culture, the, I, I, you know, there was an ongoing debate about the purpose of higher education, you know, by now, you know, these, these, these arguments are, are, are sort of had everywhere and people understand what was happening, but, but in 2015, it was just not quite as mainstream. And so I was removed from it. I didn't understand that, you know, there was this sort of birth of social, social justice, identity politics, all this stuff, accusations against Erica Christakis, uh, calling her racist, you know, defending cultural appropriation, all these things. I didn't even know what a cultural appropriation was, and I had to have three or four students explain it to me. <laughs> and, even the, and so, so you know, that was, uh, you know, a strange time for me. And when I tried to, yeah, when I tried to get students to explain to me what was offensive about it or try to explain to me the reasoning and the ideology underlying uh, why they wanted to get Erica and her husband fired and what transgression they had committed... None of it made sense to me. And gradually, you know, at first I'm like, maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably the dumb one. I don't understand it. Just I'd ask around. Some people would just get mad at me for even asking. Some took pity on me or patience and they would try to, you know, okay, let's, let's try to explain it. And I still didn't get it. And then eventually I realized like, oh, this is probably because it's mostly nonsense. Um, and, you know, there, I got some of the responses I got. There was one, one student who told me I was too privileged to understand the pain that Erica and her husband had caused the, uh, the Yale community. And, and, you know, and uh, mm. who was this person and why did they think that you were privileged? I mean, she was, uh, you know, she was just this like, rich white girl who went to Exeter and, uh, you know, it, which is a private boarding school and came from a rich family. And uh, I mean, you know, whatever rich, uh, upper middle class, at least, you know, very, very, very affluent, at least, you know, compared to where I came from. And she was trying to explain to me, you know, just just how much pain these professors had caused and you know, the sort of traumatic language and so on and so forth. And, you know, I'm trying to understand, like, the, why why would you use these words, like, for, for an email, of all things? And I realized, like, oh, these words mean something different to these students. Some of it, I think, was a little but, bit but cynical. Specifically, but specifically, sort of, if yeah. you asked, as perhaps you did, like, why, how am I privileged? What what, what would her response have well, been? Well, so, so I wasn't, you know, by this point, I didn't, I didn't, um, I, I didn't, like, broadcast where I had come from or anything like that. I guess if I, in that in that specific conversation, she didn't really know, you know, she didn't know my backstory or anything. I think she just looked at me and saw, oh, this is a, you know, like a cisgender kind of Asian-ish looking guy. Uh, you know, he's probably from, you know, she made a bunch of assumptions based on how I look mm. and assumed that I am a privileged person. Later, I would ask students, you know, like, 
what actually sort of determines privilege? Is it your, you know, because they, they would also talk about lived experience too. You know, your lived experience confers this legitimacy on your opinions to expound on social ills and to suggest solutions and so on. But then they would also talk about how, you know, by dint of the way that you look or your gender or ethnicity and so on, like those sort of uh, also are uh, like grant legitimacy to your opinions. And so I would ask students, so what's more important, lived experience or your, you know, the, the, your social category that you belong to? And some of them would say, you know, uh, you shouldn't ask that question. It's kind of dangerous. It's kind of like, you know, it's, you know, you should be careful depending on who you ask that to, or you should phrase it in a more careful way or whatever. Other students, um, would say, um, things like, you know, your, your social, you know, your, your, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation, those things determine your lived experience and they're, they're sort of intertwined. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, like, this is just total nonsense because, you know, I had lived the kind of life that I'd had. I grew up with plenty of poor white people, too. And, you know, like the, the town that I grew up in, I mean, so my foster siblings were mostly black and Hispanic. I grew up in a mostly sort of working class, white and Hispanic town in California. Uh, later, I took a, a 23andMe DNA test uh, and I learned that my father was Mexican. And so, you know, I'm half uh, Latino, half Asian, you know, my mother's Korean. And so, you know, I, I just uh, I just think that like the, the whole thing is con the whole debate around cultural appropriation and all of these things are just confused anyway. So when I was at Yale, I'll tell you one story. Uh, one of my friends, one of my good friends, we're still good friends. He's a he's a, a military officer now, actually. He went through the ROTC program, but he's a Mexican guy. I was hanging out at his dorm at Yale and he had a sombrero hanging on his wall. And this was before I took that 23 and me test, by the way. So I take the sombrero off the wall and put it on my head. And he was like, and he was joking, but he was like, Hey man, that's cultural appropriation. You can't wear that sombrero, put it back. And, uh, and then after I took the 23 and me test years later, this was you know, just a couple years ago, um, or last year, actually, uh, I sent him the results and I was like, Hey, my Latino brother, <laughs> like I sent him some message like this. And I was like, remember when you told me I can't wear a sombrero? Well, guess what? I'm allowed to now. And we were joking back and forth about this, but I think like even that, the fact that I didn't even know my own ethnicity and that a lot of people at Yale would have seriously accused me of cultural appropriation for wearing that sombrero. But the reason why I, I could slash could, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't even know who my father was. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that discovery would somehow allow me to suddenly wear the, you know, I just think like, it's so confused. It's so um, sort of narrow minded the way that these definitions work. Uh, and so, so anyway, you know, sort of running into those opinions and those viewpoints, you know, led me to realize like, actually, you know, a lot of the students here are smart, but the ideology they're supporting isn't very smart. <laughs> so um yeah, it was just really disheartening to see like what had happened to Erica and and the fallout from the controversy there was just um, it, it was just shocking, honestly. And I, and I, you know, and we've seen we've seen, you know, a lot of a lot of similar events since then. One of the things that uh, you observe is a very big distance between what your classmates uh, say about how people should lead their lives and how they themselves lead their lives. Um, so the fact that, uh, you know, for example, they advocate for uh, ethical non-monogamy or various forms of polyamory, even though they come from uh, families that are very traditional in terms of a structure and expect to have marriages themselves that turn out to be quite traditional in that respect. The fact that they say that um, things like discipline aren't really important, that um, you know, what determines whether or not you get into college is luck more than anything else. Um, but then they're, you know, incredibly hardworking and uh, would probably impart some of those virtues to, to their kids as well. Um, tell us about sort of that discrepancy and, and where it comes from. And I feel a little bit of a tension the way you talk about that. It's, at times it feels like it's a form of obliviousness um, mm. that perhaps you're not even aware of the extent to which lives are structured by certain forms of discipline or certain forms of uh, just genuine orderliness. And so therefore, it's easy to say, oh, it's fine to be less disorderly because they don't actually, you know, we can't quite fathom what it means to grow up in genuine disorder. And then at times, mm. you seem to have a nearly more cynical view of it, that it's, that it's kind of a way of beating out the competition of saying, you know, you know Goldman is uh, uh, you know, and McKinsey and so on are these terrible, evil corporations. And if I can convince some of my classmates 
but that's true when they might not apply to them and I might have uh, you know an advantage when I when 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 I do so so both explain the phenomenon to to us and perhaps help clarify sort of which of these two interpretations of why they're acting that way seems more accurate yeah yeah well so I coined this term luxury beliefs uh, a few years ago to sort of describe uh, a lot of a lot of the culture you see among sort of upper and upper middle class people um, especially Grad, you know, students and graduates of elite universities, um, luxury beliefs I define as ideas and opinions that confer status uh, on the affluent while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. And yeah, there is this, you know, a, a core feature of a luxury belief is that the believer is sheltered from the consequences of his or her belief. And so, you know, there is this kind of element of duplicity, whether conscious or not. And, you know, I, I can get into that in a second. But, you know, so so I, I had this conversation just just as an anecdote to illustrate this. You had mentioned, you know, I, I had a conversation with a, a former Yale classmate who, you know, she was telling me that monogamy is outdated and that marriage is this kind of patriarchal, outmoded institution. Um, and then I asked her how she grew up and she was raised by two parent family, stable structure. I asked her, you know, once she's finished up with you know, law school and wherever she goes next. And, you know, she was at this point, she was working for a, a, a tech company applying to law schools. But, you know, eventually, you know, once you if, if and when you have a family, how do you want to do that? And she said, I want to have, uh, you know, I'll probably end up having a you know husband and get married and kind of have, you know, have that kind of uh, conventional family life. Uh, but just because I want to do it doesn't mean it should have to be for everyone. And that, you know, I, I do think that marriage is problematic and so on and so forth. And I thought this is interesting because she benefited from this institution. She intends to carry the benefits of those institutions forward to her own children. But her official public position is, you know, people shouldn't have to do this or or she's publicly denigrating it and saying, actually, you know, don't do this or that it's, you know, it's problematic or it's oppressive in some way. And I encountered that repeatedly. You know, you use the the example of the, the the investment banks. You know, some of these students would say that they were emblems of capitalist oppression and that they were evil and so on. And then I, you know, I would I would hear about them or I would see them uh, at uh, you know these kind of recruitment sessions on campus uh, for Goldman Sachs or some of these uh, these these well known firms. And so I think some of them, some of them are <laughs> like legitimately. Uh, manipulative and duplicitous. I would. I mean, I think it's a. It's it's probably a numerical minority. Maybe ten to twenty percent of them are are actually very strategic and very calculating in this way. And and you know, to be honest, I, I've met these people who are sort of candid in terms of like how they approach life, in terms of viewing everything from this kind of zero sum cost benefit analysis. How do I how do I get ahead? Uh, no matter what bridge I have to burn or or which relationship I have to manipulate. I would say probably 80% of people are, their hearts are in the right place. They're trying to do the right thing. They think that, you know, maybe, maybe we, sh we should move beyond marriage. Maybe there are, we could reimagine the family, these kinds of things. And, and they are trying to legitimately think of ways to improve lives, the, the lives of other people. Um, but it's just very short sighted. Um, most of these people are, you know, the, they're continuing generation students. By now, almost everyone who gets a degree from an elite college has at least one family member who also went to university. Um, they come from, you know, affluent, comfortable backgrounds. They've almost never met a person from a working class background. Most of them have never had a 20 minute conversation with someone who doesn't have a college degree or tries to understand what their lives are like or what their family life was like um, and tried to carefully understand how, in addition to the sort of you know, this term, but you know, I don't like it, but you know, this kind of material privilege that they had. Yes, they had more money and they want to reduce everything to material privilege without also understanding the benefits of having the guardrails of two parents, of, you know, having uh, the values instilled in them of hard work, of success, of striving, of punctuality, respectfulness, integrity, those kinds of things of of you know, just just ambition and and trying to trying to do the right thing. And so. I make this point in the preface of my book that I've actually met a lot of affluent people who, you know, I, you know, as imperfect as it is, they've attempted to at least imagine what it would be like to be poor uh, and try to really think about what it would be like to not have had the material privileges that they've had. But I've never met anyone who's tried to imagine what it would be like to grow up without their family, uh, to grow up in the kind of severe uh, disorder uh, disorderly home life where no one is really monitoring you or checking whether you're doing homework or 
having to to change schools all the time or those kinds of things. And so, you know, it's uh, both of those things are important. I think, you know, we should be addressing poverty and inequality in those questions, but we could also be looking more at the family. Um, Melissa Carney has that great book that she had just published, uh, The Two-Parent Privilege, great book, you know, sort of a compendium of the data of all of the benefits of having two parents who are looking out for you. And the other thing is like, you know, yes, there are people who who don't have that, uh, who have money and who are, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that even, even if you are sort of in that sort of upper strata of society and your parents are divorced or they aren't doing particularly well, you still have a bit of that financial safety net, but it's actually even more important for your kids when you don't have the material privilege to at least try to form stability for them uh, and there's interesting research on this of, you know, when, when researchers do the statistical controls or just sort of track families over time, they find that kids from wealthy families who come from severely unstable environments, maybe there was divorce or alcoholism or domestic, um, issues in their home, despite being wealthy, those kids are much more likely later on in life to become addicted to substances or to commit crimes or, or self-harming behaviors and so on compared with um, kids from low-income families that are not divorced, that uh, uh, are very stable and secure and so on. Uh, and you, I think you can see this, I mean, even just sort of anecdotally or intuitively, you can see this with like immigrant families, a lot of them uh, are low-income, but they uh, value marriage and they value family and they tend to keep things together and their kids um, do end up doing uh, much better than you would predict from their uh, income alone. Yeah, it's interesting because to me, um, this kind of mediating variable of social class seems really important, right? Again, mm -hmm. as somebody who grew up in a context in Europe where most people did not have very stable family units, uh, but in a middle class environment, in an environment of people who are highly educated, even if perhaps not always financially uh, particularly affluent, um, you know, as somebody who spent a lot of time in France where uh, actually sort of working class people are more likely to get married than upper middle or upper class oh, interesting. people. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, that does not seem to lead to the same kinds of social ills in those contexts. Um, I think that's still probably, it's still the case that even once you hold constant for social class, people with two parent household tend to do better than, than those who do not. Um, but certainly it doesn't lead to you know the kind of bad life outcomes and, and dysfunction that you see in the States. But that mm -hmm. seems to be because it is, um, cushioned by all kinds of background factors of social stability. You know, if you have two uh, parents who uh, earn good money, who share a certain set of values about how to raise their kids, who perhaps have interpersonal skills to make sure that even before they get divorced, they actually continue to have, uh, you know, pretty warm relationships with each other. They stay involved, you know, the dads stay involved in the kids' lives. Um, you know, there's a broader social context of people who look out for each other and so on. Uh, and of course, there's some amount of welfare state and social institutions that step in as well. You could see why whatever disadvantages come from the breakdown of a stable parental unit um, are cushioned. Whereas if you're in a context where all of that is lacking, then the sort of uh, risks of that just, just, just end up um, having a much bigger impact. Yeah, no, no, yeah, but that's a good point. I mean, I have friends now who are parents, you know, I have older friends who have, you know, kids who are in elementary school or middle school, and they're divorced, and they're sort of upper middle class, you know, the mother and the father are both educated, but they're divorced or separated. Um, but they they earn good money. And, it, you know, in addition to the money, they also have the cultural capital. And so even if, you know, even if the parents are are less attentive than they would like to be to the kids, they have money to send the kids to chess camp or to whatever sort of, you know, math, math competitions and, and uh, uh, you know, summer, summer programs. And so these kids, you know, their schedules are filled with productive, intellectually stimulating, creative pursuits. Um, whereas for working class families, you know, if, if, if the, the parents are busy or separated or working and, and don't have the time or the resources, that's not, you know, the kids aren't going to be going off to chess camp. They're going to be doing what my friends and I were doing, which is sort of roaming the streets looking, you know, looking for ways to get high or get into trouble or whatever. Um, and then, you know, there's a bit of the cultural capital element, too, because even if you were to deposit, you know, huge sums of money into poor and working class families who are separated or divorced, you know, I, I, it, it may improve things. But they, you know, things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, math competitions and chess camp, they, these just aren't on their radar. Uh, so even if they had the money, 
you know, you still have to sort of be inculcated into a so certain social strata to know how to use it in a certain way to set your kids up for success later in life. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I, I, you know, there's, yeah, it, yeah. I think all of those things are important, the sort of the economic and the, the, the cultural elements here of, of what divorce and single parenthood looks like uh, in the sort of upper versus, you know, the haves versus the have nots. I want to get a little bit deeper into this concept of luxury beliefs, which I have to say, I, I didn't quite realize you had coined because it's become a very commonly uh, used term. And I think it is a very useful term, uh, but it's also a term that's, I think, sometimes misapplied or sometimes applied too, too broadly. Um, uh, so help us situate this term in a broader tradition of thinking about status distinction um, and, and, and help us explain exactly what it means. So, um, you know, in the 19th century, uh, one way of um, uh, displaying status was to engage in very time-consuming uh, activities that aren't productive, right? If you're spending uh, your whole day playing cricket in the United Kingdom, um, uh, you know, that's a way of demonstrating that you don't really need to earn money. Um, uh, you mentioned the very nice theory that one of the functions of having a butler and a huge amount of domestic staff is simply to signal the ability to pay them. Uh, which mm. is, of course, uh, a very costly status marker that therefore is quite effective. Um, uh, you know, how is it that luxury beliefs, are, you know, what makes them luxury beliefs? Why is it that there's a set of views you hold uh, because you sort of have a luxury to be able to hold them? And why is it that these beliefs can help in a way that perhaps is analogous to those 19th century examples to confer social status under our changed uh, circumstances. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's my claim is that luxury goods have, to a large extent, replaced, uh, or luxury beliefs have, to a large extent, replaced luxury goods. Um, this isn't to say that luxury goods don't still signal status and, and confer uh, uh, a certain amount of prestige on, on the owners of those possessions, but beliefs have become... A new expression of of cultural capital. Uh, this this term coined by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu in the mid twentieth century. So yeah, the, you know, you mentioned uh, these theories from Thorsten Veblen, who wrote the theory of the leisure class in the turn of the twentieth century. And uh, in his time, it was about luxury goods, about performing your class through the way that you dress, the way that you carry yourself, the activities that you partake in. Um, by the mid twentieth century, Bourdieu was pointing out that. Uh, a lot of a lot of wealthy people will convert their economic capital into cultural capital through having intricate and sophisticated knowledge of art or wine or literature or sort of rarefied domains of knowledge that uh, if you're a working class person or a manual laborer, you wouldn't have the time or the resources to have access to that information and to be able to communicate it in the right way. And so my claim now is that luxury goods are an expression of cultural capital of you know, if you express certain luxury beliefs uh, and and express them in, in, in the proper way, that you are, in fact, signaling that you probably went to an expensive college, that you have the time and the means to sort of read the right articles and the right books and podcasts and the latest bestsellers, and you're around the kinds of social circles with these kind of avant-garde uh, ideas and so I write at so, length, so, for so there's at least two yeah. ways, uh, mm -hmm. just to double click on this, there's at least yeah. two ways of interpreting luxury here. And I, I wonder which of those two you have in mind, whether it's okay. both, right? So one is that as George Orwell, who I love quoting on this, says, you know, there's some people, there's some things that are so stupid that only <laughs> highly educated intellectual people might believe them, right? So one mm -hmm. is, this is an idea that it wouldn't occur to anybody to have, and you have hmm. to be exposed to this very luxurious education, you have to have gone to the right kind of graduate level seminars in order to understand that this is the set of beliefs that is de rigueur if you are applying to be, you know, a writer or an editor at the New York Times or whatever it might be, right? So one of these is kind of luxury in the sense that the nature of these beliefs um, is so unusual that you have to be part of a very select social circle in order to acquire them. You have to have access to the luxury of a rare, very rarefied education in order to hold them, right? Another interpretation of luxury is that 
uh, it connects to what you were saying earlier, which is to say that these are views that have negative social consequences, but you are insulated from them, right? So uh, uh, defund the police, let's get rid of the police. Um, you can't afford to hold those views if you live in a poor neighborhood where without the presence of police, you would be very likely to be victimized. Mm -hmm. um, you seemingly can, at least for a number of years, afford those beliefs if you live in a very rich neighborhood in which crime is low in any case, or in which perhaps in worst case scenario, you might be able to move into a gated community or, um, you know, higher private security. Um, and so therefore, the, the sort of what makes these luxury beliefs is that you ha have the privilege, I suppose, of a luxury of living in a kind of set of social circles where the negative consequences of those beliefs uh, wouldn't affect you in a direct way. So I guess, which which of these yeah. meanings is luxury getting at? I, I would, I mean, there those two can, I think, sit alongside each other uh, in the luxury beliefs framework. Um, more so the first one, but you know, the their luxury. These are luxuries in the sense that they're they're first they're expensive to obtain uh, because you have to be able to afford the right education and the right access, and you have to have the kind of job where you can afford to keep up to date with the latest information and the latest luxury beliefs. Um, and they're luxuries in the second sense that um, you stand apart from society, you're not affected by them personally, uh, whatever the consequences of them may be. So, so in both senses, uh, they, they are luxuries. Um, you know, you, you, you quoted Orwell earlier, and I, I, I like that quote. I had a professor at Yale, uh, John Gaddis, who liked to say that uh, common sense is like air. The higher you go, the thinner it gets. And, you know, I think there's something something to that as well. But but yeah, so there are luxuries in, in, in both senses. Um, they're expensive, sort of economically, financially expensive to obtain. And you're shielded from from any kind of fallout. Um, but, you know, it's 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 a sort of a sociological framework. Uh, so it's not meant to be a sort of a direct analogy to luxury goods. Um, some people have accused me of saying, you know, actually, this is just um you know, you're you're just rebranding virtue signaling or something, but it's not. It's not. It's not virtue signaling. Um, some luxury beliefs are uh, sort of intended, I think, to some extent, to demonstrate one's moral character or ethical virtue or something. But there are luxury beliefs that aren't aren't that way um, too. Uh, and so, I, well, I think an one example of that. So there are, there are a couple of that that come to mind. One that I mentioned in the book is uh, the uh, tech tycoons. You know, tech tech entrepreneurs who will sell very addictive technology to the masses and profit from it, while personally having very strict rules about uh, screen use at home. Um, Steve Jobs famously wouldn't let his kids use iPads. Uh, there are reports of uh, entrepreneurs and 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 tech uh, employees in Silicon Valley who some of them have nannies and they tell their nannies to very carefully monitor how much their kids use these phones, or they send them off to schools that are screen free. Uh, and then meanwhile, you know, there was a, there was a story uh, uh, in the LA Unified School District just a few years ago, where they spent, you know, some some huge sum of money to get iPads for all of these kids in LA. You know, I, I was a, a product of the LA Unified School District. So they give all these kids iPads thinking it's going to improve learning outcomes. <laughs> and instead, what happened was, you know, these kids basically found a way to like hack these iPads and just start playing games and, and surfing the internet. And it actually, uh, their, their, their learning outcomes uh, did not improve. In fact, they went the other way. They actually uh, uh, were, were worsened as a result of this. Uh, and so I think, yeah, just um, but what's, the technology what's the use would be yeah. What's the luxury belief here? Because mm. it, it seems like one necessary element of a luxury belief, at least as I usually have understood the term, mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, it doesn't correspond to common sense. Mm -hmm. That it, in fact, uh, is in some ways misguided, um, uh, right? I mean, on the whole, it seems that luxury beliefs are ones that are, in fact, erroneous in some important way. Um, but here, that doesn't quite seem to be the case, right? Which is to say that, um, you know, there might be hypocrisy going on here. There might be selfishness going on here, right? Like, let's sell all of these iPads uh, into schools, and that's going to, you know, be good for business. But, you know, sort of we don't want our own kids to be spending all of this time there. But but I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling to locate where the luxury belief exactly is in that example. Because to say, hey, you know, perhaps it's not great for kids to be on iPads over time. Uh, is, is that the luxury belief? Well, so so, so I, I define luxury beliefs in this in this kind of narrow way. And and you, you'd mentioned before, it does sometimes get misapplied or people 
um, have stretched it to to encompass other other phenomena. Uh, and, and, you know, I understand it, right? I mean, if you coin a term or you you throw an idea out there, people will start to play with it and do do interesting things with it. But the definition I give is ideas and opinions that that confer status on the on the affluent while inflicting costs on the lower classes. Right. And so so selling addictive technology um, is mm. profitable and it increases your resources and your wealth and your position in society. If you start a successful company, of course, you get rich, but you also become famous and so on. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, you know, eventually, at least the affluent who buy the technology, learn to manage it or learned to exert some kind of control over it, either for themselves or for their, their families, their children. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, everyone else, I mean, you know, I just, these are just, you know, this is pure anecdotes, but I know people, you know, non-college educated people who are, you know, addicted to TikTok. Uh, you know, I talked to a guy the other day and he was like, TikTok is weird, man, because I'll open TikTok and the sun is out. And then I look down at TikTok and when I look up again, the sun is down. And like, and then I realize I'm hungry. <laughs> like I forget, you know, and like, like three hours will just fly by for them like that. And you know, you you if you're if you're an educated person in a certain kind of environment, you can learn how to structure your time to avoid uh, getting too too sucked into these these addictive technologies. Um, and then again, the, the the sort of the 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 corollary of the luxury beliefs idea: um, the believer is insulated from the consequences of of his or her belief. And so. Again, a lot of these these founders and tech entrepreneurs, um, they are shielded from it um, or their kids are shielded from it uh, in a way that other people aren't. You know, when when the L.A. Unified School District starts giving kids iPads, even if the parents don't want their kids to have iPads, the school's going to start giving it to them, perhaps with the best of intentions. But then what ends up happening is uh, their, their lives don't improve and they often get worse. Um uh, briefly, one interesting example that you use is Hamilton. When you arrive at Yale, mm -hmm. Hamilton, the musical is all the rage, and uh, you want to be able to participate in that uh, uh, cultural product, but but it's too expensive. Getting tickets for it is 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 outside of your budget. Um, but then, by the time that it becomes available on Disney Plus to watch and stream, suddenly the sort of smart money, the smart opinion is to dislike Hamilton and to point out how deeply flawed it is because it has too positive a view of um, the sort of nature of the American founders. I mean, I sort of, uh, I found it interesting because I was really struck by that transition um, mm -hmm. as well. I'd given it a different interpretation. I thought that it was kind of part of a transition from the uh, uh complex optimism about America incarnated by Barack Obama uh, to the sort of deep rejection of the American story and experiment that characterizes, uh, I think, you know, these parts of the ascendant left today. It sort of goes from, uh, you know, the idea that America is a deeply flawed country, but that it can be fixed by the things that were always right in its tradition um, uh, that Obama stood for to the idea that, uh, you know, America has from its founding been an uh, irreconcilably racist, sexist, and so on society whose foundations have to be rejected. Um, and so, you know, Hamilton was, I think, sort of uh, in a way the most striking cultural product of the Obama era. And so the rejection of Hamilton was part of a rejection of that Obama narrative. Um, you sort of see it in different ways from a class perspective that, you know, um, uh, when this was a rare good that you had to have a lot of money or very good connections in order to get access to, it was popular. But then once it became, you know, available to the masses for the not quite cheap price of a Disney Plus subscription, um, uh, you know, it had lost its cachet. Um, I'm not sure if these two stories are necessarily in conflict with each other, um, but 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 I guess I wonder how you, how you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's it, we can't go back and run the experiment, but it would be interesting if, you know, assuming that Hamilton continued to be, you know, I, when I looked up the, you know, the cheapest tickets in 2015, when I first learned about it, I think it was $400 for the uh, the cheap seats. And if it had remained that way into 2020, that if it had remained, you know, inordinately expensive, uh, instead of being sold to Disney Plus, that I, I wonder if the attitudes around it would have, you know, would have would have would have been different if the response to the the Hamilton the the the, the critics and the, the 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 ridiculing of the play would have would have been more muted. Um, but that was, I mean, yeah. So so I I very much took this kind of uh, status signaling class based analysis of you know okay so so when Hamilton was was too expensive 
for ordinary people, that's when it's the highest. And yeah, it's a rare good. It's kind of like a, a available and good. Uh, you know, the, the higher the price, the higher the demand. And then once it's it's freely available, suddenly, um, you know, it, it almost almost like the, you know, I, I mentioned Canada Goose Jackets uh, in, in my book as well, that Canada Goose Jackets for a time were you know, 900 to a thousand dollars. And then a couple of years later, you could see them sold at sort of secondhand stores or Goodwill uh, for, for um, much more affordable prices. And then, yeah, the Canada Goose brand had kind of lost some of its luster. And I think a similar thing happened with with Hamilton as well. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think the other analysis is, is, is incorrect either. Um, all of those things kind of tied together that even, even the Obama era kind of optimism, um, you know, that was, I think that, that in itself was a kind of, a. uh, it started out, I think as, as the, the, the general attitude of sort of the chattering class of after Obama was elected, there was a great upswell of optimism, uh, in society. But then once the kind of tastemakers and so on turned their back on that view that it sort of trickled down. And so I think both of those two things can be, can be, uh, uh true at the same time. Well, I suppose one of the ways of putting it is that, um, to think that this country is irredeemably rotten is a luxury belief. It's an easy thing to think if you have a pretty nice life within it. Um, it's it's a lot harder to sustain uh, when uh, both you come from a group that has historically been terribly treated and is actually doing a lot better today. And, um, you know, you're in circumstances that you want to transcend, that you want to improve. Um, I want, uh, as a final question, to ask you about the most straightforward political upshot, uh, as you see it, of your own story. We spend a lot of time talking about social mobility, um, and it would have been very easy to write your book as a pee into social mobility, um, right? You, you, you grew up in these very challenging circumstances um, because of your grit and your smarts uh, and a little bit of uh, luck in, in, in a couple of uh, positive turns you take. Um, you know, off you go to... Uh, the Air Force and to Yale and to do a PhD at the University of Cambridge and to become, uh, you know, a well-known writer and and, and media figure. Um, but that is not the uh, uh, implication you take from 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 your own story. You think that what matters is not uh, trying to identify some people who we can sort of take out of um, more challenging circumstances or out of a working class. Um, it is to change uh, uh, the, the, this, the nature of what life in that class looks like. Um, uh, uh, what would that uh, entail? How is it that we can make sure that uh, a, 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 as few kids as possible go through the challenging experiences that you had, particularly in your early life um, in the years and decades to come? Right. Yeah. So that's that's the point that I make. And, and this is why I dwell so much on the lives of my friends. And near the end of the book, I sort of describe their where they ended up, at least, you know, as of a couple of years ago. And that is the, you know, so I just, you know, yeah, a couple of them went to prison, menial jobs, you know, multiple children with different women out of wedlock. I mean, that's the kind of modal outcome of someone, you know, you stick someone with my, you know, uh, uh, you, know, you, you try to predict the life of someone with with my life or their life, where it's going to go, it's much more likely to look like their lives than mine. And so I didn't want it to be this sort of triumphant story of, oh, if you just work hard and focus and whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's join the military. I don't, I, I think this is not a, it's not a solution. Um, I mentioned how a lot of, you know, I, in, in many ways, our approach to social mobility may backfire because universities, elite institutions, they strip mine uh, talented and ambitious people out of these environments. And then subsequently they relocate to a handful of, uh, cities in search of, you know, and it's a perfectly reasonable decision in search of, you know, professional opportunities and places where they can, um, make the highest return on their educational investment. And so you go, whatever you go off to Yale or you go off to Stanford, then you move to San Francisco or New York, and you're not going to go back to Red Bluff or Ohio or, you know, these kinds of places. And instead, I would like us to focus more on, okay, well, what is, you know, what is life like for the people who remain there, who don't, for whatever reason, end up going to an expensive university? And in that case, I think, yeah, we could, we could, of course, focus on, you know, people want to focus on economic issues. I think that's fine. If we want to find ways to financially support poor families, I'm, I'm not at all opposed to it. But I also think there's a cultural piece that people are reluctant to describe as well. I mean, 
I think a lot of our, you know, a lot of our discussions, we retreat to discussions of economics because talking about culture makes people feel judgmental. People don't want to talk about values. They don't want to feel like a, you know, a school marm, you know, wagging their finger at how they people live their lives. But I think that's fine. I think it's okay if you've, you know, if you've benefited from a certain set of cultural practices to, to think about, you know, how they benefited you and, and how and why you plan to carry them forward for your own children and to think about, okay, well, this is how I'm living my life and you're a relatively comfortable person, that it's okay to talk about how, you know, these are practices that are available for everyone. And that, you know, obviously we shouldn't judge and condemn people for making different decisions, but we can still hold up the ideal of the two-parent family. Yes, it's true that a lot of people don't live up to the ideal, but that doesn't mean you should discard the ideal and say, well, because a lot of people don't live up to it or because they fail to, you know, meet meet that standard that therefore the we should just, you know, dismantle it completely. Um, people who wield a lot of influence in society, I mean, there's, you know, there's research on, you know, consistent research that actually elite influence does have some non-trivial uh, uh, role to play in terms of, public attitude, public opinion, practices, beliefs and habits and so forth. And so if the tastemakers and the members of society who will a lot of cultural influence do start talking about the importance of family, the important, you know, the the the, um, the relevant outcomes for children, this too could could play some important role in, you know, getting people to reconsider how they live their lives or the decisions that they make. And I'll just give, you know, the, a brief example here. I've in the last couple of months, I've talked to two different people, and both of them are, you know, they're, they're readers of my Substack, and these are kind of upper middle class. You know, one was an executive, and one is a, a tech founder. Both of them told me that, um, you know, essentially they were having some difficulties in their marriage. There was no abuse or mistreatment or anything like that. It was just they were just kind of bored and a little bit unhappy, uh, and you know, thinking, you know, maybe this, you know, maybe this marriage has kind of run its course. But they, they both, you know, they had small children and. You know, they were sort of on the fence about whether or not to dissolve their marriage. But then they had read some things that I had written and you know, reflected on some of my thoughts about it. And they reconsidered. And now they're speaking with their wives. And, you know, one of them is enrolling in couples therapy. And they they went in a different direction simply because of something they had read. And I think to me, this, you know, this small anecdote um, does illustrate that the opinions uh, that we encounter from people that we like to read and that we admire and that we respect and so forth. It does. These things do play a role in our lives. Ideas matter just as much as, as economics do, I think. Rob Henderson, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Yasha.